Awesome. Welcome, everyone, to I think this might be the first event for Black Star. Welcome, welcome, welcome. How is everyone doing? Awesome. I have the honor to uh, be interviewing this fabulous artist right here. I'm going to give you a bio and then we're going to launch into some questions. This will run for about 30 minutes, give or take, or less. Um, we go ju we're just going to go with the flow. Violeta Ayala is a multifaceted creator spanning the roles of filmmaker, technologist, writer, and artist. In 2020, she became the first Quechua member of the Academy of Motion Pictures, Picture Arts and Sciences. Co-founding UnitedNotions.Film and, and, uh, and KOA.XYZ, Ayala has been instrumental in driving innovative projects. Filmography La Lucha documentary uh, is in is what we're going to be seeing here at Black Star. Uh, another film of theirs, or she, her, what's your pronouns? She. She, her. Um, thank you. Ayala, um, uh, so Prison X is another one. VR Interactive and Immersive Animation is another one. And Cocaine Prison, another one. Many, many, many different films here. Bolivian Case, The Fight, Stolen, um, exhibition Las Awichas. There's a, there's a lot here, um, and we are so so happy to have you here with us. I want to launch into some questions. I saw your beautiful documentary yesterday um, to just prep for this, and it had me going through all the emotions. I was I was like feeling like strengthened. I bawled at one point. I just stopped. I just started crying. I had to stop the film. Um, there's just these very powerful, powerful moments throughout the film, and I, I want to just go through some questions with you. Um, the the film, to give a little bit of background, is around disability rights activism in Bolivia, and um, one of your um, one of the people that are profiled is a is a guy named Marcelo and he says in the within the first 10 minutes he says we have to put dialogue first and in order for that to happen we have to give up something what does that mean to you to begin with I would like to pay my respect to the indigenous people in which land I'm standing on today they were are and forever be the guardians of this land Marcelo is one of the main characters of La Lucha. And I think what he refers to is that he's talking about opening the dialogue between the government and the people. And I think he's saying, he also says, first we have to get uh, bread and then we have to get cheese, right? Uh, a lot of people were, were saying, there is a lot of problems that you have. But the first problem that we have to address is la renta, is to get this pension, the disability pension that will benefit absolutely everyone. That, that's the biggest one. And then we can go and ask for the, the next uh, things. It also, for me, in a way says that it's a little bit this difference between Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. And I think Rosemary is more like a Malcolm X and says, no, we can't negotiate. And, Mar and Marcelo is more like a uh, Martin Luther King that says that we have to negotiate. I think I am more of a Malcolm X myself. And I think that um, in a sense, even with La Lucha and La Renta and the pension, they, all, they always wanted what they got in the end. I'm not going to spoil the movie, but they always wanted that. And they put double so they can negotiate it down. So they... they it seems like you give up something, so the other part feels like they're also getting something. I think it's a little bit in that sense that he refers to, he's talking to Felisa and says, you know what I mean? You want everything, and she's like, I don't negotiate, you're the, you're the one who negotiates. So it's a little bit of that, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And you see that it's the women who are like, no. <laughs> and he's, like, he's the one who's like, okay, well, we, we give a little, take a little type of thing. Um, we are told how much disabled people are criminalized, but La Lucha really shows us how that happens. Like I mentioned, there's a moment in the film where you're just really seeing the, the cruelty of the government towards these disabled folks. Tell us 
what it was like to show up in the face of opposition and risk being confronted by law enforcement? I think when we started it, we never imagined what would happen. Never in my wildest dream. I think when we started it, we thought that the film will finish when they get to La Paz. <laughs> and the film started when they go to La Paz. Um, it was confronting to begin with because you think they're fighting for the rights of people with disability, but they're fighting for the rights of everyone because we all can have a disability. We, this is, it's a matter, things can change in a millisecond in your life. So they are fighting for the rights of everybody in the world, not just for people with disabilities, everyone in Bolivia at the time. The police, the thing is, the police are the instrument, right? The people in power are the ones who are deciding what will happen. And I think the police had a very interesting relationship with the protesters. Sometimes they even cried. It's like, you are making us to do things that we don't really want to do. And we have to, not everybody, some policemen had a conscience, others didn't. And the fact that um, they were brutal, yet I think if they were protesters without disabilities, it would be worse. Another thing that happens also that the people who are pushing are the people who can hear, the deaf people. And they have a different relationship with the police because they don't hear. That's why they go and they go with everything and they fight because the perception is different. Then I realize they, they don't, because the police go, who, 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 to scare you. And then they don't get scared. So they go and fight in, in, the, in front. And then your idea of who has a disability, what type of disability they have. I think all of these nuances, like La Lucha in many ways, is very complex. has a lot of layers of complexity that needed to be peeled like, a, like an onion, right? For us, it was hard. I think everybody, everyone in Bolivia that was actually documenting in some way or perform, perform this issue suffered a lot, of, uh, a lot of problems with the authorities and the police. Um, we were personally attacked. They, it, was a, it, it was a massive media campaign against myself saying that I work for the CAA and things like this, that I want to destabilize uh, Evo Morales' government. It was difficult. Um, we made a short, and after the short came out, and I did an interview with Amanpour in CNN, I couldn't go back to Bolivia for like a year because it wasn't safe. Um, but then you realize how much people with disabilities are criminalized because we like to see people as others, and they were the enemies now. And you realize that rather it's easier to criminalize people with disabilities than sit down and have a dialogue. Because that's what the government failed. The only thing they wanted to is to talk to the government and the government to listen to their demands. But even to sit down and talk to the president, the president never wanted to talk to them. And this was the most outrageous things because he was a president of the people. He was the first indigenous president of Bolivia. I never, I will never understand why he didn't want to talk to them. Yeah. Even to today, I really, I think that that was one of his biggest mistakes when he was so far away from the people and didn't even want to talk to them and rather use the police and force against the most vulnerable, the most vulnerable people of the country. And even that he would go as far as to say that these were as you mentioned, not just activists, but that they were working, uh, that they were like spies and that they were trying to dismantle his, what, what he had going on. I was like, are you kidding me? You clearly see that this is not happening. Anyway, moving on. Uh, Evo Morales is in, a, is, is, in my mind, in a whole nother light now. Uh, within the, sorry, you mentioned that this is the fifth documentary that you and your team have made. Um, you can also talk about your team and who are the main folks there. We want to give them some love as well. Uh, what makes this story different from the ones you've told before? I mean, we know that this will maybe talk about the, your other films and what might be similar and what might be different. I think it's a certain level of maturity in my work. I think each film is different and I don't want to follow formulas. I hate formulas. I think formulaic filmmaking is 
boring. So I think that there is a certain level of maturity that, that you get through the years and that you risk more maybe and you also you learn to trust a pace. I think I used to be a lot faster. I, I wanted the films to go a lot faster. I think now I'm trusting more the characters but also the way that we constructed and we build it. And I have worked with Dan Folshaw that he's gonna be arriving tonight uh, all my career. So I think that also Dan have trusted himself a lot more in this running this complexity, going and living in another culture and country like mine and understanding also that level. I think that maturity shows. Um, I think the music, I'm very proud to say that is composed by a Quechua composer He's 24 years old. His name is Hankel Bellido. It's the first time he composed the music for an entire film, and he's just 24. So he has a brilliant career ahead. And it was so scary to work with somebody that never made music for a film. And the only thing that I knew about him is that he recorded his grandmother's funeral, and it was so beautiful that that I wanted to trust. But, but it was a long process. So we went back, and I worked with Hankel in Bolivia. He came to Bolivia and we recorded some of the music in Bolivia. He went back to Peru and then in the end we had a remix done in Australia by uh, Rodriguez, that is a guy who, uh, I don't know if you know Sampa the Great? All right, see, he produced, he's the first, he's the one who produced the first album of some pedigree that became uh, big, no? And then Redilia Shaw, that is also coming today, she's in LA, uh, uh, we've been working together for a very long time. And I think what it makes La Lucha different is also my trust in community. I didn't want to make a film anymore that it's just made outside of the community, so it took me so long to make because during those years in, in COVID, I was in Australia and I was locked up. So I went back and I actually re-edited the film with Rosemary, Felisa and Marcelo and actually Rosemary was really key even into tell me, telling me the bit when she says, we feel like we can fly, that was her idea. The idea of adding this narration was their idea. The idea of the government scene in the middle, that was Rosemary's idea again, and to trust the characters and to trust this process in a very intimate way, for me, that, that, that is what it made it different. Like, it made longer the process. Maybe, you know, if you go together, if you wanna go fast, you go alone. If you wanna go far, you go together. And I think that that, is what it makes La Lucha different. That is not a film by Violeta Ayala, but it's a film by Violeta Ayala and Rosemary Guarita and Felisa Ali and Marcelo. And I think that that is what uh, shows the complexity in a different way. It's also a film by United Nations Film, but also it's a film by the entire community in a sense. And I think this is what it sets it apart and it's also the trust, again, the trust that I have on my own talent, on my own inner pace and the pace of the film. I love when we as artists get older and more mature because there's something about just sinking back into and trusting and just kind of letting go a little bit. So, yeah, I totally feel that. Um, I, I think we only have like 10 more minutes, so I'm going to look at... well. You were about to get into this when we were just talking. What is it like for you to premiere your film here at Black Star? Um, for me, it's a big honor to premiere my film at Black Star Film Festival because we're changing. The world is changing really fast. In 10 years, we're not going to have the same world that we have today. Completely different. And what matters is community. And I didn't want to premiere La Lucha in a festival where the curators uh, curate for 150 festivals and, and, and the audiences are the same audiences and they watch the film as objects and they're all white middle class, I'll be honest, white middle class people that come and watch a film from a very different perspective and point of view and they have no really, really, real relatively, relatively, like relation. Yeah relationship as a community. I think that 
the fact that Black Star Film Festival, it's a film festival that started from community, from a woman like Maori, that is not like a corporation that is behind it, that is that it has grown organically, that is a festival that is also not like a face to a white supremacy movement, but it's a festival run by by black people and that is opening its doors to indigenous and other uh, people of color. I think for me that's fundamental in this change. I think that we can keep saying we want something different if we keep going and begging to premiere in Sundance or Toronto. I, I, I done it all and you know, it didn't feel right anymore. I do want to be part of that change. I want that change to be real in a sense of, I think the Black Star Film Festival is going to grow to a point because what it matters is community. What it matters is the audience. What it matters is, is the philosophy underneath. And what it matters is that we, what, we don't want to talk about diversity. Come on, you know what I mean? We didn't create the problem, so we shouldn't be talking about it. I want to talk about the art. I want to talk about the filmmaking. I want to talk about the issues. I want to talk about the future. I don't want to keep talking about that I don't want you to accept me anymore. I, don't, I didn't want the white people to, or the white infrastructure and system to keep accepting me. I'm bored, and that's boring. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Please give a warm round of applause for Violeta Ayala. Uh, so great talking with you. And the, I think that the other wonderful thing about Black Star is that our filmmakers are, you know, they're accessible. Like, we can talk with them and share our thoughts and our hearts with them about their work and be in dialogue with them. And it's a place for artists to just be in community, as, as she was saying. So thank you all for being here. And we'll keep the conversation going.